So good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming tonight uh, to our very special event. My name is Tim Kelly. I serve as the president of the Undergraduate Psychology Association here at BU. And uh, tonight we are hosting what will hopefully become an annual series of events here on campus, the last lecture. The premise behind tonight's event is, if you knew you only had one last lecture to give, what would you say? The idea behind tonight's event is to give a faculty member the chance to lecture as if they knew it would be their last chance to do so. Some of you may have heard about the last lecture from the now famous book written by Randy Pausch, a professor at Carnegie Mellon University, who gave a last lecture after being diagnosed with terminal cancer. Tonight, here at Boston University, we have the honor of welcoming a beloved faculty member to the podium, and we hope to hear from her for many times to come in the future. At the conclusion of tonight's lecture, we will be accepting donations of any size in honor of our speaker towards local domestic violence shelters in the area. Our speaker tonight has taught in the psychology department here at BU for many years now in classes ranging from Psych 101 to seminars in family violence. She is well-educated, experienced, and has done everything from teaching to advocating for the rights of individuals with disabilities. For those of us who have had the privilege to have a class with her, we know how she makes an effort to get to know her students and show care for them. When asked about her experience with her, a former student said, she is hands down the greatest professor I have ever had. Moreover, she is the most wonderful woman I have ever known. She is inspiring and sweet as can be and truly cares about all her students. While many of us simply call her Professor West, we all know she has been so much more than that. She has been an inspirational mentor, a caring friend, and a devoted teacher to students in all of her classes. So now, on behalf of the Executive Board of the Boston University Undergraduate Psychology Association, it is my honor and privilege to welcome our speaker tonight. Will you please welcome Dr. Doe West. Oh, hot damn. <laughs> Thank you. What pleasure, honor, thrill. What a sea of faces and hearts. For me, I could go home now and I've already got a pot belly on my soul. But for you, I will stay and offer my lecture. People ask me, would you be able to be comfortable doing a last lecture format? For me, that's status quo. Truth is, I give every lecture as if it is my last lecture. That is the passion that my students, my family, my friends feel for me. Every lecture is everything I know and I feel. Why? because I care, because I believe in you and your ability to come to your full potential. And when I say you, I mean the communal you. I will offer some facts, some interesting theories, and my own perspective. Nice thing about not having academic standards I have to live up to tonight. And I ask that you please consider taking this and creating your own insight and perspective and then live differently. Let me be blatant. I want to change your path. I want to reorient you. I teach a foundational belief of mine, knowledge is responsibility. Once you have insight, you're not free to live in an ignorant manner any longer. Or if you so choose, I then ascribe to you that you are part of the problem. And I always invite you to be part of the answer. I have been asked, okay, heavily questioned, about my higher grade point average in my classes. I offer this understanding. My students don't love me because they get A's. They get A's because I love them. I believe in them. 
I'm a crier. You're going to have to bear with this. <laughs> I encourage them to rise to higher ground, and I trust them to live up to that responsibility. That's why my students get A's, because you live A lives, and I commend you. There is one difference that I'm going to offer from what Tim, Tim said. Perspective. Tonight is not about it being the last lecture that I will ever give. But what if this was the last lecture you ever heard? What if what I say is the last words that you have the opportunity to take into your minds and hearts that will impact the way you decide about how you will act at one key moment, in one key situation, with one key person. That's my focus. What if this is the last time you will ever hear something that changes your orientation, your path, your life? That's why I'm here willing to put onto videotape the fact that tonight I sound like a herniated bullfrog. Monday, bets were being laid by those around me about whether I would be in the hospital today because I'm dealing with bronchitis and some walking pneumonia. But I did every healing thing that I know to be able to stand here with you tonight because of my commitment to you. So here I am, battered body, broken heart, strong spirit. So bear with my voice, and please, ignore it, and listen to the message. Because tonight, it's all about you. Because I care. A bit of a preface. As Tim mentioned, as many of you know, in 2007, Dr. Randy Parrish gave his last lecture that I would say exists sort of as cultural benchmark when people hear the phrase last lecture, he set a standard of excellence. Randy shared his childhood dreams, how he achieved them, and key lessons that he learned. He gave it as a public lecture, but as he said at the end, his second head fake, if you saw that, was that it really was for his children. And so as a rich biographical sketch that allowed his children to see their lineage and learn his insights. It was filled with wonderful tribute to his family, his friends, his students. I loved it. Didn't you love it? So I would like to just for a moment, let's just take a moment in tribute to Randy and his wonderful family. As I said a few minutes ago, this is not just for my biological family. My, my sister, my brother, my nephews in Massa, California, my nieces in New York, this is for my family. The ones I hold in my heart and in my life as my family. And as a Native American, that means not only those who share my DNA are bound to me by legal agreements. On their website, White Earth Tribal and Community College spoke to it in words I will offer here, because I'm never afraid when somebody gets that profound grasp of the obvious and says it so well, I'm never afraid to give credit and use other words. Traditionally, American Indian families include a wide circle of relatives who are linked together in mutual dependence. Family members share resources and responsibilities. This encompassing concept of family is referred to as extended family. There's also a spiritual dimension to the idea of family. The Dakota use a phrase that means all my relatives. All my relatives includes not only the Dakota, but all human life, plant life, animal life, all things of this earth. American Indians use a symbol of a circle to describe the kinship and the interrelationship of all nature. The seasons, life passages, we are a circle. They say mutual dependence. I say interdependence. We are 
interdependent. We are linked. You cannot do something without it impacting me and vice versa. In America, we focus on independence. Believe me, I know. I'm an old hippie. I fought for layers of that independence, that freedom. Had I foresight to understand what those intentions would morph into, I would have fought different things in different ways. They say we cannot give maturity and wisdom to younger heads and hearts, but if that's true, we should close down BU and every other school and send them on their way. Of course we can. That's what education is. We cannot give maturity, but we can give insight, our path of wisdom, and then help guide our generations behind us. I think we fought for freedom, and then it seemed that there was a shadowing assumption that meant that we were all then meant to just go do our thing. We did. We went way too far. We went way too fast. And today we are suffering because of it. Our earth, our earth is dying. Al Gore did a magnificent work, but people grab reasons to not listen or not care because of ideology. So if you find yourself rationalizing why you shouldn't listen to the voice of Al Gore, <clears throat> then reorient yourself. Don't focus on the voice, as I'm asking you tonight with myself, but listen to the message. So if you need to imagine whoever you would respect is saying the same thing, Abraham Lincoln, Martin Luther King, Wally the robot. I don't care if you will listen to the message because the message needs to be heard. Our earth is dying by our own hand and hardened, selfish hearts. Our culture is morphing into a narcissistic, lustful, selfish group of voyeuristic lemmings that are heading into unfulfilled lives cut short by obesity and preventable disease. Ouch. <laughs> Take the knife from the heart. But I care. So I say it. Our youth is our future. And that future worries me. When I see where we are in terms of some of the physical, emotional, and moral places we have gotten to in life. Anybody who's been in my class, hello. Um, as I, I so often start my class by reading articles. And I do that to assure that my students know that what I'm teaching them isn't just dead facts but then I'm always bringing it into current context. We bring it into what's happening today. And so, oh my gosh, I brought articles. <laughs> Bystanders ignore dying woman's pleas. An 81-year-old mugging victim who had been mugged on the street died of her injuries after passerbys ignored her pleas for help, thinking she was drunk. She was on her way to a library lecture when she was attacked from behind, according to reports. She suffered serious head injuries, a broken left arm, multiple fractures to the left side of her face after being dragged to the ground. She cried out for help but was left on the pavement for 10 minutes as people walked by before finally someone called emergency services. When Mrs. Morgan was attacked, she fell to the ground. We believe she was on the pavement for about 10 minutes. They said she told authorities one man walked right past her and didn't even stop when she asked him directly for help. It's our belief that this man and other people in the area who didn't assist the victim may tragically not have realized that Mrs. Morgan had been attacked and was in considerable pain. Woman calls 911 three times over Chicken McNuggets. Authorities say a Florida woman called 911 three times after a McDonald's employee told her they were out of McNuggets. A police report said 27-year-old Fort Peace resident told authorities she had paid for a 10-piece last week, but was later informed the restaurant had run out. She was refused a refund and told where all sales were final. 
A cashier told police she offered a larger portion of different food for the same price, but she became irate and continued to call 911. Like most boys, 13-year-old Mendel Mendes lucked up to his big brother, Jordan. The two rode bikes together, did yard work together, hung out together. But when it came to the family business, a major drug ring, Mikhail did not want to share. Mikhail, a seventh grader, is now accused of masterminding the slaying of his 16-year-old half-brother so he could take over the drug operation. When police said they inherited from their father, who was in prison running for one of the biggest cocaine rings on Cape Cod, Jordan was found shot, stabbed 27 times, dumped into a pit where his body was torched. <laughs> yes, Lord, we're listening. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Is it okay to continue? Okay. <laughs> See, he gets pissed, she gets pissed too. Okay. The killing had shaken the normal quiet winter on Cape Cod and they, it, they live near the Kennedy compound. And no, don't blame it on the Kennedys. Another new conspiracy. Hospital, 15 fired for looking at octuplic mom's file. 15 employees were fired for improperly accessing medical records of the, mo the mother, the octuplet mother. A Kaiser spokesman said, we always provide training on the importance of patient privacy and confidentiality, so Lord knows how shocked we were that someone would go in. State puts porn pervs in sights. Pervs preying on the elderly or disabled will soon face harsh new penalties under the first of its kind proposed law that will punish sicko peddlers of geriatric and handicapped porn the same as child pornographers. Fueled by a rise in sex abuse against the elderly and disabled and a string of cases inv involving photography and cyber postings, the proposed legislation will add seniors and the handicapped to kiddie porn laws. Obviously, with technology evolving, the crimes committed using that technology have increased. Recent cases include a pair of caretakers who took their disabled boarder on a state-to-state -state party, taking sexual photos along the way. A man with cerebral palsy who could only talk with a communication board was mocked and harassed by caretakers who snapped pictures of his genitals. A mentally retarded woman had pornographic pictures taken of her, excuse me, and posted on the internet by relatives. Ten products you should forever ban from your home. Let's see if any of these are in yours. Non-stick cookware. They're now letting us know that they were introduced, thought to be a godsend. We now understand that it, when it's <laughs> heated, it releases toxic gases, been linked to cancer, organ failure, reproductive damage, and other harmful side effects. Plastic bottles, everybody hold up their water. <laughs> Conventional cleaning supplies, chemical insecticides and herbicides. Antibacterial products, all of the pump stuff I've been asking all of you to use so that we don't spread flu to each other. Chemical fertilizers, old bulbs, bulbs air fresheners, flame retardants, and plastic shopping bags. So go home and clean out your home tonight. And House. Anybody here watch House? Whoa. So who saw this one coming? As I mentioned last week, my DVR cut out, and I never saw the teaser for this week's episode, so I had no clue we were in store for this. Let's get into the nitty gritty after the cut so people who haven't yet seen the episode can avoid the major epic spoiler. So Kuttner killed himself. I'm frankly at a loss as to what else to say about this. We opened the episode with Taub covering for missing Kuttner since he hasn't bothered to show up. Now right then is when I thought something has gone wrong. There's a number of major surprises. And so someone broke into the apartment. I knew it was going to be bad news. I expected to discover he was somehow ill, had missed the signs. I just didn't expect this kind of illness, this kind of illness. As with all suicides in television or reality, those that are left behind spend the aftermath scratching their heads and wondering what they could have done differently and how they could have missed the signs. In this instance, it's the viewers and the doctors, including House, who are left in the exact same position. Why do you watch TV? What is your main purpose in watching TV? Like shows, like just regular shows on TV. 
entertainment come to mind? Does suicide entertain you? Is that where we've come? Rape, adultery, murder. Let's add suicide. I think we fought for freedom and we didn't know what was going to be done with it. Personal freedom and self-satisfaction has not brought us to a place of health, safety, or happiness due to a lack of acceptance of wisdom to be gained from any honest mistakes. We're throwing away our knowledge and our wisdom. Where should a lot of our knowledge and wisdom be coming in our society? From our elders. Our elders don't want to be elders. The role of elder is something of reverence. It's become a media joke. There's TV shows and websites that show the worst cosmetic surgery examples. Millions die having cosmetic surgery. Much of that is the prevention of simple aging. Gray hair is touted as something to die and deny. Wrinkles are the new leprosy. Here's the simple truth. Gravity. Not just a good idea, it's a law. <laughs> it becomes very real to your body as you age. Even if you stay within a healthy weight and strength, your muscles and your skin ages. Becoming an elder was a goal to be achieved, an honor to attain. When I go to a powwow, if I'm asked to enter a dance circle or a drumming circle and they invite me in to come in as an elder, my heart sings. And I expect that my voice will have the quiver <laughs> of my ears and my body will jiggle inside my dress as much as my decorations on the outside of my dress. Because I'm 57 years old, 58 this July, hot damn. Hot damn. I pray I have the right to claim to be an elder to you, to my students, that I could serve as an elder to and for you. Every time an elder dies, a library burns. The library of knowledge is gone unless it's passed on and received. You who would find a way to prevent a public book burning or banning of books, please take heed. So I call out to you, we're in trouble. I'm not the only voice saying this right now. Oh, look, more articles. <laughs> Roland Martin says rules in the US should be loosened to encourage adoption of American children. Wow, what a concept. So instead of people having to go an international adoption, which by the way, I love and support, but there are people who do it because they can't adopt even a child they're fostering in America because of, what's the B word? Bureaucracy. So maybe we should look at allowing there to be a simpler way for and an open, equal way for people to foster and adopt children. Commentary, our schools get lousy grades. Call it another piece of evidence that this once great nation of ours is crumbling. Half of us believe our schools deserve a C or a D for the job that they are doing in preparing our kids for higher education and making a go of it as growing up in the workforce. An Associated Press survey in summer of 2008 found that U.S. kids are scoring in the bottom half of the pack when measured against kids from other nations. The bottom half of the pack. What's going on in our schools? Story today, bully side. Troubled 17-year-old shot himself after classmates told it to do it. This young man went to school. He's one of those people that faces bullying from other students, didn't yet have his self-esteem in place. So one of his classmates said to him, why don't you just go home and kill yourself? Because nobody would care. 
and he did. Police say Angela Parente of San Pr Sun Prairie, Montana, let her 12-year-old daughter drive the girl's three younger siblings to daycare. Parento allegedly told police she didn't want to drive because she was sick and on medication. So it's so much wiser and safer to let your 12-year-old drive your other children to school. David Pesci was charged February 13th with one felony count of child abuse after his nine-year-old son wrote in a school essay his dad had allegedly shot him in the buttocks with a BB gun while he was blocking the TV. Commentary on schools and parenting. Illinois school bus driver posing for a mugshot was found guilty of intentionally slamming on the brakes to throw misbehaving kids from their seats in the school bus she was a driver for. And we still don't have seat belts in our school buses. A fourth grade teacher in Ohio took half a sick day so she could make some quick cash as a prostitute. She was arrested in a motel. After leaving school early, she allegedly posted money for sex ads on the website Craigslist, which has been busted now how many times for prostitution? God bless you. I do this to my students every class, don't I? And you sit there, and there's different times where I see you saying, Lord, 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 don't let her pull up another article. <laughs> but my precious ones, I didn't write them. I just read them to you to make sure you didn't miss them, to make sure that you weren't unaware. I don't want you unaware. So there seems to be this collective fear and anguish as more and more eyes and hearts recognize that we are indeed in a terrible time of crisis. And I'm not just talking about the economy, though the economy certainly is a wonderful example of where we have come. So what now? I'm going to respectfully offer some of my insights and my understanding on achieving your adult realities. I will note some things from my life, as Randy did, and what I bring forward from my own learning that perhaps could be something that will be useful for yours. Randy started his lecture by naming his elephant. And then he dropped down and did push-ups on the stage. <laughs> I don't have an elephant. I have a small zoo, lupus. Um, I was 22, in college, dancer, going to be a doctor, thought I had just finally overstretched the knee tendon, you know. That was I was accused of anyway by the doctor when he said, well, you probably have been dieting, you girls, I'm not a girl, you girls, you diet, I didn't diet. Well, have you lost weight? Yeah, about 25 pounds. But I just thought God and I had an understanding about hot fudge sundaes. <laughs> it certainly didn't bring me to the doctor that day. I was there for a bad knee. I did exercises. I began to limp on my hip. He said, you're walking badly on your knees, so you've got bursitis in your hip. So he tapped and drained my hip. Six months later, pain in my both hips, knees, feet, hands, fever every day, exhaustion, lupus. And in 1972, when I had onset of this, I had someone come to me from the college to help me to understand. Cripples don't go to college. That's what I was told. Cripples don't go to college, though. Hmm. What are you proposing? You can't go to classes. I teach anatomy and physiology labs. Oh, well, you can't teach, though. Hmm. So by God, I went home to let it happen, you know, to become one of them, the handicapped. Any day, you know, if I just wait, you know, 
I don't know, maybe I thought I was going to grow hairy face, start to drool, twitch. And then all of a sudden I realized I was still me. I was still me. Then I went through diagnostic process because I didn't look like traditional lupus. Turns out I was born with this thing called Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Rubber man syndrome, connective tissue deficit, bleeding disorder. I do spontaneous dislocations, shoulders, hips, funny to watch, not funny to experience. I developed asthma. I developed secondary fibromyalgia with chronic fatigue syndrome after the first 25 years of chronic pain. Bottom line, I'm now 37 years chronic pain as we speak. This past two years has held times of some pretty significant metabolic crises. And I was hit where I feared most. I went through a time of these metabolic imbalances hitting my cognition. And see, that's what I had left. When the body wasn't working, I still had this. And I went through a very frightening time. I've had places of awakening. I found some pretty ugly things that happened while I wasn't quite there. But as I get everything balanced and I'm becoming stronger, I'm doubling my attention. So what were the key lessons learned from my disability? I'll tell you three. Why me, us versus them, and victimhood? Why me? Why me? I was 22, a dancer. I was going to be a doctor. I was going to save the world. Come on, God. I'm the baby of the family. Why me? And then I had that time in the house, you know, when I was waiting to become one of them. When I began to think about it, and I thought about my family, I thought about my Gramsci. My Gramsci. <laughs> Can you tell by the face? <laughs> Gramsci was a hoofer in Broadway. He was a jockey when he was young, one of the most caring, intelligent, wonderful guys. And when I was growing up, because my mother moved back in when she was expecting me, still had two in diapers, my grandmother and grandfather took us in, began to be parents to us as well. Graham was 60, Gramsci was 65, and he had this thing. This thing made him have to stay in the car when we went shopping. You know, he'd come up the stairs when we come up from parking the car, and he'd walk up the stairs. And he'd get to the top of the stairs, and he'd lean there, catching his breath, and I'd just get underneath him, and I'd just keep talking, you know. Because what does it matter to me? What, who, I couldn't even say emphysema, so what? But he got a check every month because he couldn't work. So to get that check, what did somebody else call my grandfather? Huh. My grandmother. My Native American grandmother the little Wookiee. Remember, I'm the Amazon at 5'5", five five. so she was about yay. You know, pure flint and steel with a heart of fire. But I cared for my grandmother through the last years of her life. Alzheimer's. Grant had Alzheimer's when Alzheimer's made you not able to get into a nursing home. And so I suffered that special double death. The death of the woman that I loved and then being left to care for her body and then the double death when her body finally passed. And then there was my mom, God bless her. And so much of my life is impacted by my mentally ill mom. And I thought about my boys, my nephews, oldest boy Rob developed diabetes when he was young. You know, they didn't come and be with us till they were 2, 14, and 16. So by 16, he hadn't been cared for in terms of you know, the same level of care wasn't available, even by the time we got him to Leahy. You know, and then Rob, when he was 35, because you know, God doesn't promise only one, Rob developed MS. And it took him in two years. I didn't know that then, but I knew everything else. So when I sat there and I thought about why me, I realized, why not me? that there already were people in my family that were disabled. I just never once called them that. I called them Gramsci and Grand, Mom and Dad and Mer da 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 da. Who in your family? Think of your grandparents, your mother, your father, your sister, your brother, yourself, your extended family. 
There are people in your family that that label hooks onto. Would you let anybody call them them? Of course not, because there is no them. There is only us. And victimhood. I spent a lot of time in the disability rights com community. I met extraordinary people, dated some real hot tickets. <laughs> and I found that there were people in the community who had an amputation of two fingers that were much more disabled than people who were paralyzed from the neck down and had their respirators built into their wheelchairs. It was not the medical disability that handicapped them. It was whether or not they let it become a victimhood status. You will come to a place of crisis in your life, whatever it may be. You will come to that crossroad. If you believe it will break you, OK. But if you think it could break you, but you fight back, then you will find that you don't have to be a victim. Randy spoke of the love and devotion of his parents and upbringing and how his dreams were shaped. I love family stories like that. If I see an act of kindness, give me a Hallmark commercial, I cry. And I cry because of the places of scar tissue in me. I don't have that story. If I share some things from mine, I don't want you to think that you ne yet understand anything about me by hearing any of these things. So the first thing I'll tell you is my memory doesn't kick in until I'm a senior in high school, when I'm 15. And I can then see my hand reaching down and locking the door on the room that I finally had given to me as my room in the house. So my memories are flashes, sometimes nightmare flashes. I borrow a lot of memories from people who knew my family, who knew me. I borrow memories from my sisters, who ironically I have asked each of them at different times. Don't you remember, where was I in the house? Where was I? And both of my sisters will say, I don't know. I don't know where you were. Mom and dad met, had a romance, eloped, and then life hit them. And my mother's man, uh, mental illness manifested more fully. And so after he came back from the war, she began to have her children. And with each child, the mental illness began to manifest more greatly. By the time she was pregnant with me, she was pretty much in active psychosis. Daddy left, and the madness ran the house. I'll give you a couple of key memories. Randy gave key memories of his mother and father. One of my first key memories of my mother is her telling me she tried to kill me. The moment she realized that she was carrying me, she tried to starve herself to death and was so sorry that it kept failing. And so I was born. I remember the Christmas that I finally went out I started to work full time when I was 13. I bought a Christmas tree. I brought it home. It was a scotch pine. <laughs> My mother apparently was allergic to scotch pines. Touched the tree, broke out in a ranch, a rash. And I remember the sight of the Christmas tree being thrown through the glass window and being told, clean it up. And I remember one of the last years when I was caring for my mother through the end of her life. You want a life lesson? Take care of your abuser. Bathe the body of your abuser. And in that last year of her life with us, she suddenly realized it was my birthday one day. I don't know why it suddenly came to her attention, but she yelled at me that I had to take her in the car and take her down to the drugstore. So I took her down to the drugstore. She went in, she came out with a bottle of hand soap and threw it at me. And I think the bruise lasted about two weeks. Key memories of my father. He left. <laughs> he left us with a mentally ill mother. And God bless him, in those days, it was handled very differently. It's mine, not mine to judge. 
many of his actions. But he went out and established a wonderful <laughs> life, became known as a philanthropist, a wonderful family man, but told no one that children existed back in New York. One of the first things I remember seeing from my father was a note to my mother when she said I was in the hospital again, when he said, what are you running, a hospital clinic? I'm not going to pay for these medical bills. I remember that because mom threw the note at me and said, so you have to start paying your own medical bills. I was 11. I remember writing him letters and getting them returned, returned to sender, stamped on the letters. But occasionally he would have his secretary type a response. So I kept sending the letters because his children, you know. And then one Christmas Eve, my father called me. 1972, he called me. We spoke for about two minutes on the phone and it left me with that most dangerous of all emotions, hope. I was so excited. And then later, his last letter to me, Dear Ms. West, you don't know me, I don't know you, leave it at that. So my lesson learned is family is a group of people held together by blood and by marriage and may not necessarily be willing or able to love one another or even be friends. So, so that's something you might have to deal with. You might, and many of my precious students do, share stories with me that your family was not there for you or even harmed you. Okay, that's one piece of you. Just one piece. I have heard the adage, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Well, that's nice on a cereal box top, but <laughs> what it does do is it does leave scar tissue. And it can disable and even kill parts of you unless it is healed with time or resurrected later. So if you have something that's in you, please do it. Heal it. It can be done. That's why I tell my stories. Do you understand? That's why I tell my stories. Not for you to go, oh but for you to go, oh, oh, hot damn, <laughs> right? If she, so yeah, I tell my students that I was abused in my home and in my life as a child. I let you in. I let you all the way in. I use clear, clear words, emotional abuse, verbal abuse, sexual abuse. Yes, I use the word incest. Because if I use the word, I'm not doing it to titillate, but to liberate other people to be able to use that word. I was abused by my mother, and I was also abused by a family friend that mom decided she'd fill the void of my father, and then he told me this is what daddies do. But I was also abused by others around me. Another family member who had no intention of harm and was a child herself and could have no understanding of the ramifications. So she and I have worked this out. We have done all the healing and forgiveness necessary. But even if you do that, you still can have scar tissue. So when I was bound and gagged and thrown into a closet, and I was left there, and I vomited behind the gag, so I was choking, and I felt that I was dying, to this day, I have scar tissue. I can't el get into elevators, subways. Found out I couldn't go to an island and didn't know that until I got to Nantucket. <laughs> I can't ride on airplanes. It's cost me jobs not being able to travel. It's impacted relationships not being able to travel. And I don't have simple claustrophobia, I have post-traumatic stress disorder. So it gets complicated. But I was also brutalized by classmates. I started reading when I was two. 
I was not discovered as being in the house until I was seven and was taken out of the house by authorities to put into school, so I didn't get to school till I was seven. And because I had been reading so long and so isolated, I talked funny. You think I have cute little mannerisms and sayings. They weren't cute back then. Lord love a duck got me punched, you know? And I became the other, that strange kid put in the library. And so I was beaten and broken so badly that one day the nurse brought me home to my mother and said, don't bring her back to school, they're gonna kill her. And so my mother took me to a different school. So yeah, I have a few reasons that I could claim victimhood. You know, I could probably go out on disability, do a good case for post-traumatic stress disorder, physical disability, write a memoir, go on talk shows, <laughs> <coughs> excuse me, cascade a lot of blame and bitterness. I could lead the, lead the next societal change in exactly the wrong direction. My life was battered and scarred, simple facts. But what do I do with it? It's my life. What do I do with it? If I let my life end, that's my responsibility. I'm not a child. Once I got to a certain age, I became an adult. I became responsible. But yeah, it adds layers to my current life. When I became disabled, it added an interesting layer both pro and con. The con was that I was again reinforced to understand that life can take this really nasty right hand turn. That, you know, I can't get into elevators and I use a wheelchair, think about it. Um, but I also found that I had survival skills. What are some of those survival skills? I've had the pleasure of a lot of your, my students, I've used a lot of these with you, some of you have heard some of these. You've called them doisms, I've heard. <coughs> um, so tonight I'm going to say some of them pretty quickly. Gird your loins. Ready? Tenacity. Life is relentless. You have to be more relentless than life. Please note, I did not say you had to be stronger. Face it with your hand on your hip and your fist in the air. I said you just have to be more relentless. And you have to do it with balance. Even too much of a good thing is bad, as I later found out with more hot fudge sundaes. <laughs> you need options. You've got a problem, spin it, turn it, examine it, three-dimensional. Compassion. This is a word you hear me cry out to you often, don't you? Compassion. We are so lacking in this, and it's it can heal. Compassion is life's chemotherapy if we could just get the IV flowing. Not pity, not even sympathy. Compassion. Throw in some empathy. Gratitude. What's the latest thing you are kvetching about? You know, we have become such a land of kvetchers. I have gotten to the point where I have to hear CDs in the car because I can't stand the morning DJs going on and on and on and ragging on this and doing on that and gossiping. It's like, hello. Turn it off. People will hurt you. And if you're not careful, you will hurt yourself. Life is not fair. Are you? We cannot fix everything. But I wish you'd try. Integrity. What is your true north? What do you sight by? What pulls you forward? If you try and find it in another person, you're already lost. If you try and find it in just a cause, one day you could find yourself in a Jonestown. 
You have to drive your taproot deep into yourself. Integrity is you. Courage. There's a line between courageous, foolhardy, and selfish. Be aware of them. Patience. Remember how I'm always saying to people, next books to read. Siddhartha. If you haven't yet read it, Siddhartha. I can think. I can wait. I can fast. Don't look now, but some of you wouldn't hit all three, especially the fasting. Struggle and discomfort. You'd think that this is the most violent form of S&M possible. Simple struggle and discomfort. Bio-bubble living. Many of you have seen my bio-bubble example. Who's willing to come up and do my bio-bubble example with me? Come on, somebody get up here. Thank you. <coughs> hey, Sugar Plum, how are you tonight? <laughs> Good to see you. So, right there. So, we're two people. We have a comfort zone. This is your bio-bubble. Put out your hand from your waist and extend it to fingertips. This is your comfort zone. So if she and I are facing each other, this is the comfort zone. I can actually get up right to the edge of her bio bubble and she will be comfortable. So we could be standing and talking and we're doing fine. If I lean in, <laughs> <laughs> if I lean in, if I lean in a sweet way, that means we've got a little relationship. I can tell her a little something. If I lean in, <laughs> you have to make sure you grab them. <laughs> but we have a comfort zone. Everybody knows this. This is standard psychology, sociology. Now, there's times we have to ignore it. OK, so now we're, we're standing outside in the elevator, and we're at the fine point. Now we get into the elevator, and it's crowded. So we ignore each other. <laughs> and this says, I might be in your bio bubble, but I don't mean to be. And if we don't look at each other, we'll be fine. And then we get out, and we walk away. Right? So we have bio bubble. Thank you. <laughs> the problem is that bio bubble of comfort has become your biosphere of living. That's where your comfort ends. It used to be that was the comfort of where you wanted the outside world to come to you. Now that's as far as you want to go. You plug in your iPods. Put your cell phone thing in, and you zone. And you zone in a way that you can hurt each other. You bump into each other. You walk past each other. You don't look at each other. I'll be walking down, I'll see one of my students, I'll go, oh! Ah! And it, sometimes it's like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> So, you know, you begin the, <laughs> and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, yes, and then they take you into their bio bubble. Who are your friends? Honey, it's not the list on Facebook. <laughs> Every person is just as important as you are. Strength. One of the strongest muscles in your body is your heart. Think about that. <coughs> Malignant assumptions. Oh, God, we kill each other with these every day. You get it in your head what a person is or will do or won't do. And then the minute you think about that person, you start making that malignant assumption about them over and over again. Try and break a malignant assumption. They're tough. Whose expectations are you living? Whose tapes? Whose voice? Perfection is a vicious lie. I'm going to get that made into bumper stickers. Life is way too serious not to laugh. 
don't feed the kitty if you don't want it to come back. <laughs> oh boy, I'm having a serious time. I have got to get off a Red Bull, they say with the six pack sticking out of their knapsack. Don't feed the kitty. If you feed it, it will grow. Your future is a savings account. Think of an old-fashioned piggy bank. You ever gone into your coin jar? If anybody keeps a coin basket or a coin jar, you take it to coin store and you dump it out. And yes, coins are in there, but there's also jelly beans and <laughs> you know, bobby pins and safety pins. What are you putting into your piggy bank? What gunk, if I were to take you and shake you? You've got to learn to be alone, my friends. How many times have I talked to you about this in class? You need to be able to live alone comfortably. It's one of the greatest skills, and we have lost that skill. People will do anything to just not be alone. You will give your safety, you will give your comfort, you will give your money. Just please, God, don't let me be alone. Alone is something people pay money to do when you're an adult, if you have the skill. Or you can stay scared all of your life about being alone. You have to pay the price. Everything has a price. You're deciding to come here to this lecture tonight you paid a price. You made a decision. Some people made a long journey. <laughs> some people skipped other things. Some people gave up valuable time in the middle of the week, in the last couple of weeks of class. Oh my God. <laughs> How honored. Thank you. You have to pay the price. I think of my friend Phil and Cozy the Cat. Cozy the Cat in Phil and Donna's house is not your traditional lovey-dovey cat. Think of, oh, a Bengal tiger in a very tiny little body. So that you go over to say, kitty, kitty, and it goes, Bleh. and so, you know. <laughs> but every day, once a day, Phil takes Cozy the cat into his arms and scrunches her. Because she's paying the rent for living in that house. I love that. So Cozy the cat has a price to pay, so do you. <laughs> Reality will win. I'll repeat that one. Reality will win. Get behind it or get run over by it. So if you accept that, optimize it. Doesn't mean you have to be run over, but what is reality? It's going to win. Gandhi. I love Gandhi. Wonderful story about Gandhi. A mother brought her son to Gandhi and said, Mahatma, please, you need to help me. Tell my son to stop eating sugar. The Mahatma looked at her, and he said, come back in two weeks. And she said, yes, Mahatma. So two weeks later, she came back with her son, and she said, we're here. And he looked at the son, and he said, stop <coughs> eating sugar. And she said, thank you, Mahatma. But why didn't you say that two weeks ago? He said, two weeks ago, I was still eating sugar. <laughs> Here's a hard one. You may not ever hit closure. For someone with my issues around that, that's hard. It may be that you really are going to have to find a way to compromise, to be flexible, to adapt. Randy achieved each of his childhood dreams. I didn't. But I created new adult realities that are so fine. I couldn't even have dreamed as glorious a night as this. When I first moved to Boston in 1977, my first apartment was at 45 St. Mary Street. <sighs> OK. And here I am tonight, Dr. Doe West, giving a lecture because how much she loves her students. I do pay high prices for some things. Wonderful example I was sharing tonight was my PhD. 
Very long story, totally skipped. It finally got to be the six years after it was done, the paperwork got processed properly, and it was time for me to get my PhD, go through the hooding. You know how big a deal it is to go through your hooding for your PhD? <coughs> so I was driving into Boston, finally to get hooded. Do you know what the date was? September 11th, 2001. Needless to say, as we dealt with the World Trade Center issues, there was no one I was going to mention to the fact that I was missing my hooding. But you know something? I still miss it. I still wish. <laughs> Damn. You know? Okay. So last thing is forgive and forget. Forgiveness. You are responsible to think about the forgiveness you need to do in your life. And it is right that you do outreach, but it is the responsibility of the other person to respond. If they say they want to have forgiveness between you, but then they tell you the story in exactly the same voice, the same pain, the same anger, and give a set of criteria, then the truth is they're not ready to forgive and it's not yet going to happen. No judgment, just not yet time. Leave the door open. See if there is any further healthy communication. If there is no further healthy communication, don't get into unhealthy communication. If and when they're able, they will then come to you. There must be reciprocity and balance. If you are the only one asking for this repeatedly, there already is no balance. Forgiveness is something you should do. But the thing I've learned is you have to do it with balance. And if you forgive, do you forget? Good Lord, love a duck, I hope not. Because you need to learn from it. You, you need to file it. Don't focus on it, but file it. Glance back for perspective, forward for orientation. What time is it? Now. Where are you? Here. So, my survival skills. What do I want you to do as you leave tonight? Oh, <laughs> something small like, I would like you to reorient society. <laughs> we have urban renewal. I'm calling you to higher ground so that we can effect a cultural renewal. I want a new generation of hippies. One friend asked me, do I want to make a culture of Westies? <laughs> Yeeps. I'm not trying to create a cult or clones. I'm trying to ignite a set of minds and hearts. It's not about me. It's about you. You. Which, thank God, comes around with me. It's about tomorrow because today worries me. And I need to focus on my hope. And you are my hope. I look at you and I see my hope. And for sure, you've got to remember that we hippies got something very wrong. What we got right was the understanding that love can change the world. What we got wrong is that love is not all that you need. You need a whole kit of survival tools and skills. You need a moral compass. I saw a billboard with Desmond Tutu on it and talked about his moral compass. There is no golden edition moral compass that belongs only to Desmond Tutu. You have the same moral compass. You just might not know it yet. You just might not know how to use it, so you're using it as like a water pitcher instead of a moral compass. <laughs> but it's exactly the same one. And we are in a time of change and excitement. We have a wonderful new president. There is a feeling that we will get ourselves turned around, but President Obama and Oprah are not going to do it alone. 
You know, it's like suddenly they're not going to rip off their capes and suddenly have the big red S's and fly up in the air, you know, Obama and Oprah. You know. <laughs> nice thought, but one of the things that we have lost a skill about is something that I learned as a child called civics. We had classes in civics, learning how to be citizens, learning how to be a part of society, learning how, what your, not only what your rights are, I bet you every one of you can tell me your rights, but can you tell me your responsibilities as a citizen, as a member of the society? Our children are not aspiring to be good citizens. They're not aspiring to be teachers and firefighters and police people. Our children want to be rock stars and sports figures. Fame is more of a coveted virtue than bravery, truth, justice, or kindness. It's time to restore balance, my friends. We have to get back to our civic duties. Freedom without boundaries is chaos. We get scared of boundaries. Independence, freedoms, interdependence, responsibilities. So don't wait for the outside person. The clock is ticking. It's you and I. When should you begin? Tonight, of course. I want you to go back and take one first determinated step in the right direction. I saw a quote by Lynn Nottage, a playwright, who said, let's boycott celebrity and celebrate balance. Let's boycott celebrity. I like that. That means turning from being the voyeur and gossip they're trying to make you be. You were spoon-fed on CNN's front page, Britney Spears' mental illness breakdown, as a headline instead of a piece of celebrity gossip, which is what it was. And by the way, once a person is known to have a mental illness, what right have you got to continue to judge and hurt that person? Once you know that Michael Jackson has body dysmorphic disorder, stop making a joke of humanity. Stop reading the magazines. Stop going to those websites. Stop watching those TV shows. Now, tonight, make a first step. Sacrifice. Self-control. Write to CNN and tell them to stop putting that on headline news. Break news and gossip down. And if someone is being a terrible example in our society, if they're beating their girlfriend, if somebody's acting whorish, and I mean male or female, don't allow them in your lives or your children's lives by buying the products that support them. Write to the companies and tell them that they're not a proper role model and you're not going to be suckered into it. Stop going to sporting events with teams whose members don't exhibit good sportsmanship. Oh boy, did I just get in trouble in Boston. And tell the companies why you're not going to do that. You want respect, deserve it. Do you deserve respect tonight in your life exactly as you're living it? At least a whole bunch because you're a human being, so you already deserve a whole bunch of respect. That is yours. But anything above the basic, that's to be earned. You're going to be laughed at, you're going to be belittled. It's not going to be comfortable. This freedom thing, I don't think it should be totally free. Like respect, I think you need to earn a certain amount of it. I think we need to bring back civics training. I hate what was done to harm me, but I love the lessons I learned from it. I'm not asking us to go backwards. If you think that's what I just said, you haven't heard a word I said. I don't want us to go backwards. I want us to go forward having learned, become aware, gotten insight, stopped what shouldn't be, and take it forward. Or as my beloved and precious grandmother would say, take from the fires of the past the embers, not the ashes. I hold myself accountable. I've made terrible mistakes. I hold you accountable. 
You probably hold yourself accountable. So I want you to shut your mouth when you should shut it, open your mouth when you should open it, open your mind all the time and expand your heart. A new multitasking. And please remember my intention in this lecture. Remember why you came here tonight. How many tens of thousand dollars am I making tonight? Yeah. <laughs> in fact, as some of my friends already know, the reason I'm not using graphics tonight is that my things are all packed away. Because three weeks and two days from tonight, I'm homeless and jobless, as are so many people in America today, waiting to see what next opportunity we're able to pull around. Now, praise God, I've got friends in Connecticut, even have friends in New York and New Jersey have said, we've got a room, you don't have to hit the street. No, praise God, I don't. But I have to look at that reality. And I'd like you to look at it too. It's there. Life is not fair, it is hard. So I'm not here to gain anything tonight, my friends. I'm here tonight for you. This is all for you. Don't just listen to the message. Live the message. Randy ended with two terrific head fakes. And I'll tell you honestly, there is, there is no head fake. I'll end with one quote and then one quick statement from my heart. The quote is by Goethe. This is on my office door. Many of you have read this. I have come to the frightening conclusion that I am the decisive element. It is my personal approach that creates the climate. It's my daily mood that makes the weather. I possess tremendous power to make life miserable or joyous. I can be a tool of torture or an instrument of inspiration. I can humiliate or humor, hurt or heal. In all situations, it is my response that decides whether a crisis is escalated or de-escalated and a person humanized or dehumanized. So here's the last thing I'm going to say in the last lecture, just in case it's the last thing you ever hear. I honestly do care. Please care along with me, and we can change the earth. Thank you.